That FA Cup run is obviously one of the standout moments. So what's oh, the, what's yeah. the best memory from that FA Cup um, run? We, we were playing Everton away, quarter final. If we win, we're now going to Wembley for the semi final. I think it might have been the, the first year that they'd had semi finals at Wembley. I think it might have been. So we know if we win this game, we're actually going to go to Wembley for the semi final. And um, we're, in the, we're in the dressing room and uh, we're sat there waiting to go out. And uh, I can just visualise me being sort of sat upstairs kind of away from it all you know what's going on on the pitch and I think that was uh, really hard for me uh, to cope to cope with that I wasn't actually going to be on the bench being able to take it all in um, but going to Wembley for the semi-final I just knew there was this, this we had this chance of actually getting through and going and uh, just before we went out suddenly for some reason I said corner our first corner I said what I want you to do I said quick come here have a look at this quick and we're all literally ready waiting to go out the door and something was telling me I've got to tell you about this corner I've just thought about this corner and um, what we're going to do is um, Hugo I want you to start at the near post Merce will take it on the right and he'll bend it in and I want you to spin right round to the back right round to the back post um, I'm going to get Merce to hang it up for you at the back post and I want you to knock it back in and, and then we all just pile in on Hugo's header or whatever. Anyway, as it turns out, we do this corner and I thought the first thing they'll do is forget it. Footballers are like that. But they managed to remember it. Hugo pulls out to the back post, heads this ball, goes straight down to Steve Stone. Steve Stone scores, puts his 1-0 up. So this corner that we kind of worked out on the back of a fag packet before the game suddenly worked and, and we'd gone 1-0 up. And uh, from that moment, I suppose, I just sort of thought, oh, we're doing all right. I think we might win the cup this year, you know? But it wasn't to be. Do you think about that cup final every day? Disaster, yeah. It, it, uh, as we're talking about it now, it pains me, it hurts me, it still lives with me, and I think about it often. Um, and uh, it was one of the... Oh, if not the biggest regret I've ever had. Uh, should have been more bolder as, as a manager, as the coach of the team, yeah. to have um, tried to win it as opposed to not losing it. We were, we were always a team in those days that we were so fit as a, as a group of players. I had a, a brilliant group of players, fitness-wise. and we, we called ourselves the grinders. Every, every match it was written up on the board before the game because we're the grinders, we grind, we keep going, we keep going, and eventually we wear down the opposition and, and, and we nick matches, we, we, we score goals in the last five or ten minutes because we're still going when, they, when they've given up, basically, when they've got nothing left. And I always believed that that final, we could do that with Chelsea, we had to stay in the game. And that was always something that I was very, um, very forceful about, and especially about uh, half-time. Nil-nil to me at half-time was always a good result. Yeah. It was always a good result um, because I always thought we we kick on second half. I, can, I think we played Watford at home in a league game. It was nil nil at half time. Watford's probably one and only season at that time in the Premier League. They just got promoted and they came to Villa Park and we were nil nil at half time. We won four nil uh, and that's how we were. We, we'd go out second half and we'd wear teams down. And I thought for the final that was, you know, wrongly um, the tactic that we that we should employ that particular day, give nothing away, nothing at all. And, and um, you know, last 20 minutes or so, we have the ability in the team to kick on and keep going and we can win this game and win it that way. Uh, and it was dull, uh, the whole game was dull. I mean, a lot of our players froze, as you know. Um, and, and having been there for the semi-final when it was very much the same for yeah. Bolton, you know, we won it on the penalties and uh, but we didn't play very well at all that day. And it was the same in the final. Um, we just really didn't turn up. You know, people like Merce and you're expecting sort of Merce to run those sort of games, you know, didn't really get in the game as much as he had done in the past. And, and we just didn't perform and, and, and it was very sad. Um, and it's, as I said, it's 17 years now and it still haunts me and, and will continue to haunt me because I never got the chance to do it again and, and win the cup. So, you and Doug Ellis, did you part on good terms? 
Yeah, we did actually. Um, I obviously got very frustrated uh, more than once because, you know, I kind of wanted us to, I wanted to challenge the top teams. I wanted us to be associated with uh, Champions League and things like that. And, and really the, the previous October, October 2001, we beat Bolton at home 2-1. We were 1-0 down, we won 2-1 and we went top of the league. It was the last Saturday of October. And uh, on the Monday I went to see uh, Doug about signing Muzzy, is it? I wanted to sign Muzzy. Leicester was in turmoil. Martin O'Neill had left and gone to Celtic. Peter Taylor had taken over as manager and just been fired. They had, they had a caretaker manager in. The whole club was in a mess and I thought it was a great time to go and nick Muzzy, is it? Um, they wanted five million for him. And I went to see Doug and told him that I wanted Muzzy, is it? And he, he said no. And he'd never said no to me ever before. We'd just gone top of the league. And it was like, Doug sometimes, it was like, why, why do you need another player? We're top. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, we need another player because I want to stay top, you know? And I said, uh, he said, well, if we signed him, where would you play him next Saturday? Newcastle away. I said, I'll put him on the bench. What, you're gonna pay five million for him and put him on the bench? I said, yeah, because you'll then get better performance out of everyone else, because they know that Muzzy is it, is waiting to, take their place and I said we've got to build while we're strong and anyway he said no and he'd never said no to me before and uh, I really thought that <coughs> it you know this really wasn't going according to plan you know I wanted Muzzy is it we're top of the league why can't I have them? anyway I went away and thought about it and I rang Steve Stride and I said I want a board meeting tomorrow because I said I'm not finished with it. I want Muzzy is it and I know I can get him so we had a board meeting the next day when Mark Ansell and Steve Stride came, who were fellow directors. Obviously Doug had already primed them, I think, you know, and, and still I put forward my case and Doug, Doug said no. He said no, that we, we weren't going to sign him. We can't afford to sign him, we don't have the money. And I, my argument was that this is the first year of four teams in the Champions League. We could be that fourth team. You know, we could be the one that gets into into the Champions League because now it's an extra place. I want it to be us, and uh, this is our big chance. And we basically got to go gung ho and, and try. And, and obviously, he'd seen what had happened at Leeds. I think you know yeah. Leeds had gone bust. They'd, uh, they'd spent money they didn't have. They'd borrowed a lot of money from various banks, and they were in financial. They were in financial crisis, and uh, he just kept saying no. He wouldn't. And I, I really felt that. It kind of let me down and, and uh, it didn't quite have the same ambition that I did. Um, <clears throat> and I always felt that everything was always about money at Villa. I mean, he, on reflection, you know, he was very good with the money. He, he, he looked after it. He did make sure that we never went bust. You know, we, we always had money in the bank. We always, you know, even if it was a million quid, we'd always make a profit every year because of the way that he ran the club. Um, so I was, I was, I just felt that he didn't have the, the same ambition as me, and literally from that day, I felt that um, that I'd probably gone as far as I could go. We were still sat top of the league. I still had aspirations of us, you know, finishing in that top four. But I knew that we were going to have to strengthen the squad, and, and I felt that maybe the chairman didn't want to strengthen it in the way that I did. And as I said, it's the first time he'd ever said no to me with regard to making a signing. So I was, um, I was quite angry that day, and uh, and it really hurt, and uh, I really felt that I'm knocking myself out here. You know, I'm, I'm getting up and down, driving up and down motorways, going to see matches, going to see players, uh, spending so much time sort of away from home, jumping on planes, flying off somewhere to see some distant land, to see some foreign players that I've never even heard of before. You know, and I was. I had a huge um, network now of, of players that um, I felt that I could bring to the football club. I wanted to bring um, Forland from uh, Independiente, yeah. who was scoring goals for fun, and I thought he'd been a good signing. Obviously, I saw Amar playing uh, for River Plate with uh, Juan Pablo and um, various other players. Uh, that I really felt would, would suit Aston Villa, but we, we could never really afford them. And I always felt that, you know, that Doug maybe lacked a little bit of, of ambition in that respect. 
and, and, and I had to try and cajole him, you know, and, and try and get him to get round to my way of thinking. But certainly with Muzzy Izzy, and I think that was, it, it really hurt the fact that he didn't want to buy him, he didn't want to go for him. And, and he would rather, you know, not get into any kind of financial difficulties. So as it turned out, uh, that was, that really hurt. That following Saturday, we went to Leeds, uh, went to Newcastle, lost 3-0. And I was really, really low after that. And, and I felt it, it really knocked the winds out of my sails in many respects. And I knew that the rest of the season was going to be difficult, always knowing. I always felt that we could go out and buy another one if we needed it. Yeah. And now it's kind of dispelled that sort of feeling that I had that we could match the big boys, you know. And I thought, well, maybe we can't match the big boys. And, and I think after that, it really it took a lot out of me and I was... Uh, I was really disappointed and consequently the team started to slide a little bit. We, we started to have a few problems on and off the field and, and it took a bit of desire out of me, I have to say. And uh, then I was just sort of contemplating, sort of walking away. Maybe there and then I should have walked after the Bolton game, yeah. left us at the top of the league. But um, uh, I mean, when I did go, I literally regretted it ever since. I was a mug. What is it that makes Villa your club and, and so mm. special to you? Because obviously you spent time yeah. at other clubs, but it's always Villa that you profess to love and that I've you're been there associated three times. with. I've been there three times, you know, yeah. I've been a player, gone away, come back as a coach, gone away, come back as a manager, gone away. And I just think um, there's, there's so much about it. There's uh, the stadium, the fans, the, the, the training complex, the, the, I think the, the underdog bit, you know, a bit, I, I get a bit miffed that we're still not associated as, as being a, a big club. Yeah. And every player that comes sort of says, oh, I never knew Villa are a really big club, aren't they? You know, managers that have come, you know, always say, oh, I never realised what a big club Villa was. And I know what a big club it is. And, and I think it's it's that thing that I still want them to, to be challenging for Champions League places. Um, and wanting them to get into the Champions League itself. Um, and we've obviously seen what's what's happened at Leicester last season. You know, it's it's possible yeah. if, if you can get it right. Um, so it'll always remain massive in, in in my heart. You know, I've never I've never veered away from the fact uh, the effect that that it's had on my life uh, for many many years, and and that will never go away. And very finally, where can you see us going now? Obviously, new ownership, new ambition, new future. Forward, at last. Um, been going backwards for so many years now. It's just, wow, it's unbelievable to think what has happened um, in, the, in the last couple of seasons and to actually see that finally, you know, the threats were there for many seasons, but finally we got relegated and uh, it's rather difficult to deal with. Um, but, you know, don't spend too much time looking back now. It is what it is. Uh, it's been totally mismanaged and uh, <clears throat> the wrong people have been appointed. Um, uh, the, wrong, the wrong people have been put in charge of, of the club as, as manager, um, which is no fault of their own. Um, the fault sort of has lied with the owner and, and the chief executives that have made these appointments. but. We've got a good man, in my opinion, we've got the right man in charge now, Steve Bruce, in many respects. He knows this division inside out. He, he, so many times he's, he's gained promotion. He, he's very experienced in what he's doing. I like the, the three new signings that he's just made, uh, just before deadline day. I think they're gonna be a, a major asset to the club. Steve's certainly going in the right direction. We slipped up a little bit over the Christmas period, a couple of results that we didn't quite get. But I think everything now is, is geared up towards us going forward. And um, we'll be back in the Premier League very, very soon, I'm sure. So obviously this is a huge deal for the channel. This whole series has been just incredible for both of us. And if you have enjoyed this series, then please do drop us a like below and show your support for the channel and comment on what you thought about the series. Did you enjoy it? What do you think about John Gregory's reign? How good was he as Villa boss? And as a player, if you can remember that as well. And please do subscribe to the Villa View. Your post notifications on so you can see some great content lined up just like this in the future.
If you enjoyed that video, why not watch another one? Click the video choices on screen now to go and watch them in full. And don't forget to subscribe. Click on our logo there on the left. Easy peasy. <laughs>